Welcome to the Edge of College Rising Voices podcast, uh, where we amplify the voices of young professionals in higher education. I'm Wes Johnson, and I'm joined by the amazing, the awesome... Sarah Busca. Thanks, Wes. <laughs> yep. And we're your co-hosts for the show. We're members and friends of the Edge of College Young Professionals Advisory Committee, also known as YPAC. And today we're going to be talking everything Brene Brown because that's like the big thing of the conference, or one of. Of course, we're really the big thing, that being higher ed. Uh, but we are joined by a couple of guests here. Sarah, do you want to introduce? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Wes. So we are so thrilled to introduce two of our guests today, um, Nicole Baldessare. Did I do that right with the Italian? <laughs> And Ashley Valentine. Uh, Nicole is the strategic activator at Beyond Academics, leveraging her strengths in seeing patterns where others see complexity to develop human-centered strategies that inspire action across higher ed. Nicole leads with curiosity and authenticity and is passionate about restoring the lost art of human connection in the networked age. In her free time, you can find her hosting gatherings accompanied by her signature cheese and charcuterie boards and or bothering her fluffy, grumpy face, orange cat, Ziggy. I can attest he does have a grumpy face. I saw a picture. (laughs) (laughs) Welcome, Nicole. Thank you for having me. Yes. And we're also thrilled to introduce Ashley. Ashley is a senior cybersecurity engineer with the University of Illinois. At work, she enjoys the challenge of keeping up with her cyber threats and learning new technologies. And outside of work, she enjoys hiking with her dog and trying new recipes. Welcome, Ashley. So good to have both of you here. Thank you. So Before we jump into the usual, Sarah, I want to ask, because we all just got through the start of fall semester, or at least progressing through the start of fall semester. We should clap it up. Higher ed made it through (laughs) another year. Everybody doing okay? We all make it through okay? Depends on on who's asking (laughs) and what time of day. (laughs) Always like to check. Shout out to all our uh, frontline service warriors out there uh, that are do all we can to keep the campus running. But I like to check in with everybody at the start of the semester. So then Nicole, you're doing good. Yes, doing good, supporting our clients in that first semester and, and getting everybody off um, doing that important work. Ashley, you doing good? Yeah, we're doing pretty well. I'm usually shielded from the start of the semester as much um, from within my department, but all right then. So now, sorry, Sarah, I cut you off. We can go <laughs> with the rest of the show. Oh, no, that's okay, Wes. I was just so excited to ask our favorite question on this show for our listeners who've been following us. We always kick things off by asking our guests, what is your superpower? And Ashley, would you like to go first? Uh, sure. Um, I actually cheated a bit and asked one of my <laughs> friends because I couldn't come up with anything. Um, and she actually came up with a really good one. She said that um, probably chameleon powers um because i'm very good at adapting to like new environments new situations and new people i love that we have a chameleon on the like, show today how did you come up with that within like she like did it like within five seconds so i was like okay <laughs> <laughs> that's a great one that really is well and especially like wes mentioned the beginning of the semester quarter everyone's <laughs> feeling the stress so you are a chameleon you've adapted to it that's awesome thanks for sharing and Nicole, what is your superpower? I did not prepare for this beforehand, <laughs> but I think um, for me, it's probably resourcefulness. I think, you know, if I'm in a pinch, I'm really able to pull things together in these high stress, complex situations. Even if it's three ingredients left in my fridge, how am I going to make a meal out of that? I'll be able to pull it together real quick and, and figure it out on the fly. So a very, very resourceful gal. I love that. We have resourceful chameleons on the show today. (laughs) I feel like we should use AI and create some cool artwork with that. (laughs) Well, to kind of set the stage before we dive into our discussion today, I want to give a shout out to the Young Professionals Community Group, co-led by Joseph Cottle and Arantxa Fernandez for hosting the first ever YPCG book club last month. It was very successful. And that's why we have Nicole and Ashley here as guests, because they participated in that inaugural book club event. And the focus was on, as Wes said, Brene Brown's book, Dare to Lead. We're focusing on Brene because she is the guest speaker 
main event, if you will, well, my my main event for the upcoming Educause annual conference this year in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, We all, or should most of us know how awesome Brene is, just an incredible researcher, um, kind of bringing to light, you know, things about leadership that we haven't really talked about that much with respect to shame and vulnerability and how we lead with integrity and a full heart, those types of concepts. So I can say in our book club, we had some really great conversations and I'm really excited to kind of bring that to light here for our audience today. Uh, So to kick things off, I'm curious, Nicole, how has the book influenced your perspective on leadership? I think for me, it kind of cracked the human side wide open in the professional context. I think sometimes we can be so focused on being perceived a certain way and and not having weaknesses come to the surface that in reading Dare to Lead, it really enhanced my view of it's okay to be vulnerable. And sometimes it's scary to um, you know bring up issues and challenges, even in my personal life in a, pro- a professional setting. But these are the kinds of conversations that actually promote a culture of trust. And if you don't have trust, you're not going to have a very successful team or organization, what have you. And yeah, I just think it's that removing of the veil between we are humans in a very hyper productive, you know, workplace industry. Um, But let's put that at the center, because that's actually what powers the growth within our organizations. Well said, you sound just like Brene. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. (laughs) Renee. <laughs> We're all disciples here. I hope she hears this because we are. <laughs> and Ashley, what about you? How has the book influenced your perspective on leadership? I think probably the idea that each person each person can narrow down their values into only two of them. And Mm. depending on that person's two values is how you would choose to interact with them or connect with them. Mm. Um, I think that was helped like inspire, like what I thought specifically of leadership. A lot of the whole like armored versus daring leadership. I kind of like um, have had to discover myself kind of stumbled upon. Um, But I think the, living up to your own values one was a new a new chapter for me i agree that one that section was very profound for me too actually and i remember in in the book Brene talks about it saying you know challenging us to really define it to two (laughs) and i i know also i I don't know if y'all if y'all felt this way but when i started doing that exercise i struggled it was yeah. so hard. I had a list of like 50 things. Right. And I'm like, but these all matter, right? <laughs> like, how do you narrow that down? But I'm, I'm curious, actually, maybe to kind of follow up. How did you narrow that down? And if you are willing to share, which two values did you land on? I will say I haven't completely narrowed it down yet. I do know, <laughs> that, I do know at least one of them is just growth in general. I think I put a very high importance on Um, whether that's in your career or in your personal life or just solving your Rubik's cube faster and breaking your record, like any type of growth at that point. um, I know I put a very uh, high importance on that. You know, that's really interesting that you share that, Ashley, because Wes and I have now been co-hosting the show for just about a year. And I would say the number one theme that we've heard from all of our young professional guests is growth. Mm -hmm. There's a huge focus on it for us. And so thank you for sharing that and for validating us, I guess, in our quest to kind of amplify these voices. It's really great to hear that there is some consistency and we all seem to share a theme around growth. Speaking of additional things learned, Nicole, I'll I'll turn back to you. Were there, are there any qualities that come to mind that maybe you are, uh, were aspired to implement into your own professional journey from the book? Yeah, I think to touch back on Ashley's point about values, to think long and hard about narrowing down those two that really hit home for me. Um, I think something that's guided my professional path and had me feel like I can trust others, authenticity, that's a big one for me. If you can be 
genuinely yourself around others and not feel judged or shame, which we know Brene talks about all the time, I gravitate towards those people that act like a light in their organization because they are being themselves and you can feel that, right? Like we know when, when people are faking it. Um, and then the second one kind of has to touch on Ashley's with growth, but I would say mindfulness because it brings that lens of self-awareness and empathy wrapped into it. Cause that's what I like to do. I like to have 10 that actually just roll up into two. So it kind of counts, <laughs> but <laughs> that counts. Uh, mindfulness. Yeah. I would say a, a lot of the times people don't practice that self-awareness. And I think the self-awareness is what fuels the authenticity. So these two go hand in hand really well and have acted as a filter for me in my career and the people that I interact with and want to work for, right? Um, but also I try to exemplify those values in everything that I'm doing. So that would be the big takeaway for me on the values piece. Absolutely. And uh, another plus one, you know, speaking of, you know, growth has been a theme. Authenticity has also been a theme across many of our episodes from young professional to those more senior in role, uh, being authentic, leading from their own values. Very similar. Yeah. I'm, I'm saying the Brene Brown playbook. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's timely, right? Because AI is so huge right now. And it's not mm -hmm. like it just came here last year. It's been around for 20, 30 years. It's just now become accessible. And even thinking about podcasting, right? Now you can put a document into Notebook LLM and it'll create a podcast that sounds legit like it's on NPR. So how can we bring authenticity <laughs> back to the forefront of the conversation? Um, and, and it's so important for our industry, right? Being in education, how can we filter this? for others and set the example for our students, for our staff, our communities. I could talk about this all day. <laughs> That's why we have you and Ashley on the show, because you both have wonderful ideas, our resourceful chameleons. <laughs> Ashley, do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, no, I think Nicole covered it. Um, I will say that I feel like self-awareness is probably on the, I think she called it a second circle in the book. Mm -hmm. of values because you can't I mean you can't really grow or you, you're not going to grow anywhere important if you're not self-aware yes well said thank you Wes and now I interrupted you we're both like so oh, excited yeah. to dive in yeah. we're like ah. yeah, <laughs> we're all hanging in there by a thread during this fall crunch season <laughs> So uh, I guess I'll start with Ashley. So speaking of, so we talked about growth, being authentic, self-awareness. So you have these tools, but I imagine at least I can speak on my own career. And it's kind of mentioned in the book, we can get on the topic of being brave. Mm -hmm. And there's this balance of fear and courage to display some of those very qualities that we're talking about. So Ashley, the real question being, how do you balance fear and courage in your professional journey? That is definitely a hard question. Um, it definitely helps the environment that I'm currently in, I think, um, just because I've like I've been in situations where we've had armored leadership um, mm -hmm. in previous positions. Um, but the group that I'm currently working with is very good about doing daring leadership, um, whether that is um, being transparency, becoming, being clear, um, or if it's also um, just having the courage to admit that um, something is wrong, they don't know what direction they're going in, et cetera. Um, so I think the culture where I'm currently at makes it very easy to be able to balance fear and courage. Absolutely. So I'm hearing a little bit of there's our individual values that we bring, but it helps a lot more if the culture of the environment you're in also supports that same environment and those qualities and values. Absolutely, 100% agree. Nicole, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think playing off of what Ashley just said, if leaders are more concerned with having all the right answers versus prompting the right questions, that's a red flag to me. You know what I mean? It's it's more important that we are questioning things because I think that 
is what brings a level of trust. It's not like, oh, I'm the expert top down. I know everything. It's how do you empower your team and create that culture of care and transparency so that they do feel like they can speak up or if they are scared, it's a little bit mediated because my boss might not know what they're doing either and they're not afraid to admit it, right? We're all here to work on the same challenges as a team. Even if you are an individual contributor, what is that sight line to the vision for your team? Um, so I think if we want to dive into trust and really pick that apart um, through the lens of Brene, that's something I'm fascinated by because it becomes this chicken or the egg. Do I have to have trust to be vulnerable or does vulnerability promote trust? And, and how do we navigate that in our own lives uh, and organizations? That's something I'd love for us to kind of explore and unpack together today. Let's do it. Let's what do you do think? <laughs> <laughs> well, to me, it's interesting because Brene has the seven behaviors that build trust, but she also pulls from the work of others where there's an assessment of the domains of trust. So you have this, here are the behaviors and here's my checks and, and balances on how to assess those behaviors. And for those that are not familiar or haven't read the book, I think the seven behaviors are something like boundaries, reliability, accountability, vault was, was one of them. Uh, integrity, and then I have something written over here. Uh, it's that non braving acronym, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Non judgment, braving, yeah, generosity, um, the braving acronym. So those are her behaviors that build trust over time. But um, the work that she references, like her favorite definition of trust, let me find his name, Charles Feltman. So his framework to assess the domains of trust are actually around care sincerity, integrity, and reliability. And that's where you get into things like, do they have my best interest in mind? Are they emotionally honest? Are they walking the talk? Uh, do they have clear and complete requests? So I like bringing these two things together because now you have a way to wrap your mind and, and make sense of, okay, here are the behaviors and here's how I can assess those behaviors to know that this person is trustworthy, um, they might miss the mark on one, but are they exhibiting these others? And then how can I intervene to then get my trust meter back up? That That's something that I really gravitated towards because I like the tangible frameworks that I can apply. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. I, I agree. I think many of us agree. We want tangible frameworks too. <laughs> Give us the tangible so, frameworks. Right, right. I mean, it's great to talk about things in theory and it's great to mm -hmm. understand that from a conceptual level, but how do we apply this? Mm -hmm. So kind of kicking the question maybe over to you, Ashley, I'm curious, how do you apply these approaches and what Nicole just shared in your practice? Or maybe the converse is how do you see your leadership doing that? Um. Well, part of it, again, building trust, I think, that marble jar theory that Brene Brown yeah. um, described as far as taking small actions um, and having those building trust. And then if you, uh, betrayal sounds like a, a strong word, but if you uh, lose that trust with one of those actions, it can take out a lot of marbles at once. I think that was also um, something that Melinda Gates had been quoted in the book. Um, but yeah, I think generally just like those very small actions of trust um, and showing of vulnerability um, with boundaries, within reason, of course, um, is, I don't know, a very good like example of doing things like that. So I don't know, I feel like I'm probably going to keep that marble jar theory in mind for quite a while now and um, thinking like, Maybe having a just a metaphysical uh, marble jar in my mind and thinking, oh, that's one marble, or oh, great, we, we're gonna, we're going to take out ten of them now. Um, but yeah, yeah, I love that. Maybe we all need to have marble jars on our desks and have resourceful <laughs> chameleons in them or something. I don't know. <laughs> Good visuals, right? <laughs> Well, I think it's interesting, too, because 
y'all are in the IT cyber security, like Ashley's defending against threats and coming up with strategies in her, her day-to-day -day work. So your entire root of what you do is around trust and how to foster that trust, probably through systems and architecture and all of these things. But it also lends itself to human trust, right? How do you do that within your org, even though your role is to do it with the machines and, and systems that you're using? So you're at this unique intersection of truly a trust-focused environment. And I don't know, Wes and Sarah, if that's similar for both of you, but I find that intersection fascinating. Do you want to respond yeah, to that, Ashley? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, sure. Yeah, it's actually cybersecurity has a lot more of the human element than I think a lot of people realize. Um, we're a fairly decentralized campus, so there's only so much we can do from the central IT group. We rely a lot on our IT partners throughout mm -hmm. campus, um, and that requires building a trust relationship with each and every one of them. Um, and also that goes part into building the cybersecurity culture around campus. Mm -hmm. it, it's a lot of places have cybersecurity offices that like have a bad rep. Um, in particular in higher education, it's very different from private industry where you can enforce a lot of specific rules and policies that people have to follow mm -hmm. um, versus um, higher education where you have to work with people um, in order to get those policies put in place. Um, but yeah, cybersecurity, I know, I know like it varies from campus to campus, but I know that there used to be a history of the cybersecurity being the office of no, like no one would ever, no one would ever like know about the cybersecurity. Nobody wants office. that office. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so like that was a huge like there was no trust relationship whatsoever when you have that reputation um and taking your office from being the office of no when like Keeping, people yeah, would yeah. only ever hear about you um when you're literally vetoing whatever they're trying to do um and taking going from that to building trust relationships to the fact where you have people who are cybersecurity conscious like all around campus um it's a big undertaking and it definitely yeah. there's i mean there would have to be like a million of those marble jars all, all around campus for each individual person. Um, but yeah. Yeah, absolutely, Ashley. I can say from a IT support perspective, there's the trust we build with those little marbles over time. And then sometimes I just trust that the community will forgive me in time because we have to do something. <laughs> so absolutely, there's a both of a deposit and withdrawal of that uh, marble jar uh, to support our campuses and our communities. And so plus a thousand to everything you said. So, so with that, I'm, I'm curious then, so we talked a little bit about the environment, individual values that seem to have grown after reading the book, which is excellent. We knew, we knew this, it's Brene Brown, y'all. Uh, but uh, I'm curious in regards to, let's talk about some of that environment, right? So we have our individual values and they work best in an environment, a culture that supports that. What role do you see, and I'll start with Nicole, do you see in young professionals, those earlier in their career, contributing to that environment? What's their role to play? Yeah, that's a good question, Wes. Um, to me, can we just boil it down to be a good person? <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I mean, seriously, I don't care what level you're at. You're a young professional, you're mid-level manager, you are the leader, the CIO, whatever it might be. Just be a good human and carry those two values. I'll even let you have four or five values. You know what I mean? <laughs> carry those with you and truly act out of not your own best interest, but the interest of your values aligned with that of the organizations. And I think you'll succeed. And if it means that you might butt heads from time to time, I think it's the conflict when managed mindfully that helps us expand and grow as well and become better communicators. I'm not saying put your head down and, and be a yes person. And I'm not saying go be bullish and fight with everybody to get your way. Just truly stick to your values, whatever those might be, 
and and try to be a shepherd of those values in a way that contributes positively to your organization. Like we don't have to be mean. We can build each other up. We can be cheerleaders for each other and we can create the culture that we want to work in if we just act as an extension of that vision. Does that make sense? Yeah, that just does. Be a person. <laughs> and it feels better to support people and celebrate them yeah. than the opposite, right? right? And I don't know about y'all, but I don't need any more negative energy in my life. Oh. So I agree with you wholeheartedly, Nicole. It feels better to celebrate others too and to help amplify others' voices. Right. Rising yes. voices. You know what I mean? Yes. <laughs> you you picked it up. <laughs> <laughs> So Ashley, then what advice would you give another young professional that wants to embrace the principles we've discussed today or others we maybe haven't gotten to from the book? Um, I think implementing the, the braving acronym that Nicole had brought up earlier yeah. is huge. Um, just like being able to build trust with others and then also um especially the boundary section, I think mm -hmm. is important for people that are like just entering the workforce. It's a little hard to draw boundaries, especially with newer people um, that have already been in the workforce before. And I know that's some, that's like something that I've stumbled on before when I first entered the workforce, as far as that. Um, I think also that learning to rise section was incredibly important because that was essentially how to get up after you, after you fall down. Mm -hmm. um that's a good one which um i think Brene had a more eloquent way of putting it but basically if you're gonna if you're going to uh take risks um and be a daring leader you're going uh am i allowed to curse on this look, like <laughs> Brene curse all through the book so i was like i don't you go for it if, okay, if not we'll, we'll edit it you're out gonna your, you're gonna get your ass kicked at some point yes basically yeah you're, yep. basically you're gonna fall at some point and yep. you have to learn how to get back up. Yeah, I love that. I, and I love how she framed it too. And I think um, the way she did it was great about being in the arena mm. and learning how to listen to the voices that you need to listen to and to see that there will be other voices and to recognize that if they're not in the arena with you, well, maybe you don't need to listen to those, right? <laughs> or don't take it There's so personally. A, and don't take it so personally, right? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. And then there was also that section about learning. Yeah. I think that was probably part of the arena one. Like there's people in the cheap seats. Yeah. Uh, you, need, you, need to, <laughs> yes. you need to be able to, and they're like, just like heckling at you and you need to yeah. learn to determine who are the, who, who, which people are in the cheap seats and whose opinions you should ignore mm. or not, yeah. take, or just take with a grain of salt. Right. Exactly. Instead of letting it all hit you with full force and then feeling pummeled and not knowing how to navigate through it. Right. And right. that kind of circles. Of, right. Yeah. Yeah. And that circles back, though, to knowing knowing your values, knowing who you are, knowing where you stand so that when you do hear all those things, when you're in the arena, you have a North Star to help keep you moving in that cardinal direction that you've defined for yourself. I, I can't wait for Brene to listen to this. I hope you do, Brene. No, please. <laughs> please. <laughs> well, we've covered a lot of ground today. Thanks, Wes. We're, we're on the same page today. <laughs> so we've covered a lot of ground today. And kind of to wrap things up, one question we love to ask our guests to kind of bookend everything is if there is one key takeaway or message or lesson that you want to leave the audience with, please share. Uh, Nicole, let's start with you. Hmm. One thing I would leave with folks today, I'm just going to keep it simple again. Just, just be human. I think leading with the uniquely human qualities and skills, it's not about knowledge anymore, right? We can all be a subject matter expert. We have the access to the technology and the books and everything. But if you can lean into what makes you uniquely you, you started this podcast with superpowers, right? Um, even if that's asking a colleague or a friend, hey, 
what would you say my superpower is? And then using that, to your point, Sarah, as a North Star and guiding you and what you do and how you can better serve your team and your organization and yourself, I think that would be my biggest takeaway. That's a really good one. Thank you for sharing. And Ashley, do you have any final words that you would like to share with the audience? Um, I think just taking Brene's idea of people, 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 like people are just people, even if mm -hmm. they are like a seed level executive um, or someone that someone else that intimidates you, um, being able to see a person through that lens um, they're not like, they're not just their job title. They also have right. this whole other outside life. Um, and being able to understand that I think is a really valuable lesson to learn. That's so good. Thank you both for just sharing your insights, laughing with us, bearing with us today. <laughs> this has been so fun. We really appreciate having you guys on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, y'all. So Educause 2024 is right around the corner. Me and Sarah are going to give you some tips. Woo. Yes. <laughs> We're very excited to be able to see the higher ed community at the place to be every year, Educause 2024. And so we want to, again, we want to give y'all some quick tips based on our experience. Some of us here are veterans of the Educause <laughs> space, but we saw and we heard from Educause that somewhere around 40% of you will be brand new. And so we wanted to give you something. So I'm going to kick it off. First off, do not miss the keynote speakers. We all know that as much as we love each other and we love all the things we got going on, we want to see Brene Brown and the other speakers. So do not miss it. You might not get a seat if you don't get there in time, just to be honest with you. Next up, you want to keep up with what you got going on. Educos does have an events app. It is available from my knowledge. I believe it's on iOS and Android. I don't think this event's up quite yet, but maybe by the time you see this recording, it will be. You can schedule the uh, different sessions, events that you want to see. It usually has a map that kind of helps you be prepared to be lost anyway, unless you're from San Antonio and you've been in the building. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of, it is part of the event, uh, but it is a great app. But do not stick to that. It is an adventure. When you get out there, if you see something that catches your eye, go for it. Uh, this is your time of the year to get the information you feel you need most, whether that be info or networking. And speaking of, I will pass it over to Sarah. What other tips do we have? Thank you so much, Wes. Um, in the spirit of today's episode for Brene Brown, I would say be brave. This is going to be a huge conference, especially since 40% of you have identified as first timers. Um, no matter what your age is, no matter if you're early career, mid career, late career, and this is your first time at this conference, it will feel overwhelming at times. There's a lot of folks, there is a massive vendor area where you will see big, yeah, big signs, lots of people calling your name. You're going to see people all over. You'll be in a new city if you're not from San Antonio. So be brave, introduce yourself to folks, find your people. And to help find your people, we are so thrilled to have some special spaces for you to engage and connect with us too. Um, most notably, the Young Professionals Hub or YP Hub. Uh, we've been doing this for a few years now, and it's just an incredible place to find your, your people, to find some connection, to find a place where it doesn't feel like there's 10,000 people in the room and there's just maybe 10 of your friends. Um, and this year's space in the San Antonio Conference Center is gorgeous. Um, and there's going to be a lot of really fun things planned. So if you feel overwhelmed by anything, or if you're just curious and want to meet new people, please look for the YP Hub in the app that that Wes mentioned, and there also will be signs. It's also a very big room, so it's very likely that you'll run into it at some point. <laughs> um, but also, there's going to be a ton of networking events and sessions that will be led by young professionals. You'll find that in your app. Uh, since I am from Wisconsin, I want to give a plug for my favorite event that will be happening, uh, the happy hour on Wednesday. Come get your drink tickets earlier that day for the YPCG meetup <laughs> and come meet us in uh, the YP hub for a happy hour on Wednesday. There's also going to be a CG extravaganza. So if you're curious to learn more about what the YPAC is, what the YPCG is, what all these acronyms are that we're throwing around and all these advisory groups, and if you really want to learn how to engage, 
please consider coming to that CG extravaganza too. It's also on Wednesday. And finally, we are so excited to be recording our episode, our next episode in person, live in San Antonio. So we welcome you to join us for that event. There will be an audience. So you can join us and be in the audience and interact with us and see us do this live because we do do it live every time, Wes. <laughs> every single time. <laughs> every single time, yes. All right. Well, thank you all so much. Looking forward to seeing you in San Antonio. See you at your cars.